Well, would you please turn with me to the gospel, sorry, to the epistle, to the Ephesians. We'll be in chapter 6. We'll probably wait about maybe a minute or so just to give Renee some time to set the sound up in the mother's room and also to get ready for translation. Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be reading verses 10 through 20. This is the word of the living God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all pres perseverance, making supplications for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador, in chains, that I may declare in boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious God, help us to realize that what we are even doing this morning is spiritual warfare. Having sung songs to the King of Kings is waging war on the kingdom of darkness declaring that we serve mighty King Jesus and no other. Lord, that's, that's an act of war. Help us this morning to realize who we are in Christ, what we are engaging for Christ, and how we advance His kingdom against the evil schemes of the enemy for the sake of His glory. Help this preacher to preach the word. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, truly a, a familiar text, a text that many know, a text that many probably don't know fully what it means, but in some capacity they've heard these verses quoted oftentimes. But as we begin to study this, you know, there's a sense where when we begin to realize who we are in Christ, what we're living about in Christ, there's a sense where now having the right grasp on reality. We can live in reality in the way we were designed to live in this life. For instance, there's a book that I read called Future Men. And in that book, it's teaching you how to raise future men. It's saying this world wants to make men effeminate. It wants to make men cower. It wants to make men weak because of toxic masculinity or whatever you want to call it. But in this book, it says no. Your children, your, your sons, I should say, come out of the womb looking for a sword. They come out of the womb looking for their first toy gun because that's how they're designed. That's how they're fashioned. They're made to be little warriors. So rather than suppressing that, teach them how to use their God-given design for the glory of Christ. And I thought, all right, this is just some self-help stuff. This can't be the case. So the very first opportunity I get with Augie, I say, Augie, you don't want to take a nap. You want to stay up. That nap 
is your giant, so to speak. That nap is the enemy. Are you going to slay the enemy? Are you going to rise up and let sleep conquer you? Or are you going to go and defeat the enemy? Wage war on the enemy. And it worked. He literally said, you know what? Yes, I'm going to fight this giant. I'm going to go to sleep because this nap won't defeat me. Literally, in his little words. And I'm just thinking, why? It's because when you begin to grasp who you are in Christ, what you were designed to do, what you are engaged in in this life, there's a sense where now you know how to fight the enemy. You know in the way in which you've been designed how you move forward in this life. That little illustration is just to show us this morning, we need to begin to think in terms of this life being a constant spiritual war against the enemy, against sin, and against the evil schemes of darkness. You don't hear this often in Christianity. Well, you might, but there's two types of spiritual warfare in Christianity. There's one, and that's typically what I would expect this room to be a part of. Yeah, that stuff's gone. That stuff's, we don't deal with that stuff anymore. That was for the apostles, and that was for, for the disciples because they were advancing and people hated them. We don't, we, don't, we don't have that here. And we have what's called a closed system, a closed worldview, where we can't grasp the reality of what's out there because we don't really see spiritual darkness in our day. We're starting to see it now more because the veil is being pulled back and we're starting to see the darkness come to light. But what I'm saying is for centuries in this country, most would have thought of spiritual warfare as something that you don't really deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So in this room, we need to get a real grasp of the reality of what spiritual warfare is. But now there's another side of Christianity that says that spiritual warfare is, I stubbed my toe against the wall. Not today, Satan. Stubbing my toe against the wall is an attack of Satan. Or, you know those fidget spinners, the one that you would spin? You have pastors saying, look it, it makes a six over and over again. It's the devil in your hand. And I think that's not spiritual warfare. You think the devil's going to waste his time in, a, in a, and making a fidget spinner? You see what I'm saying? Either we, we reduce spiritual warfare to be nothing, or we so heighten it that it's nothing. So this morning, as we begin to look at this text, we need a robust, complete understanding of what true, true spiritual warfare is. Because our culture is increasing in darkness. But what do we do? Do we go to our little Christian circles and then hide away until it's safe to come outside? That's not what Paul is telling the Ephesians. I'll get into that in a second. But Paul's saying, no, you don't go hide. You put your armor on and you get engaged in that war. So we have to see this case this morning is the reality of spiritual warfare. And you are all, if you're in Christ, you are all a part of that. And you're, if you're outside of Christ this morning, you are also in spiritual warfare, but on the wrong side. So let me first say this in, 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 in laying out regarding spiritual warfare. This morning we just have two tasks. Let me just develop a biblical case for spiritual warfare. And all we're going to do is get into verse 1 this morning. So first, regarding spiritual warfare, let me make this absolutely clear for the church in America that might not understand it, specifically the Reformed Church in America. Not the RCA, I just mean the Reformed Church in America. Satan is real. Satan is living. Satan is your enemy. Satan does not want you to continue on with Christ. Satan and his demons have one mission, and it's to, vow, to devour all who are made in his image, whether in Christ or outside of Christ. Satan has one mission, to diminish and to thwart the kingdom of God. And scripture is absolutely clear and unashamed to declare this to be the case. Open up your Bibles. In the very first chapters of the book, you see who? Satan coming to destroy the good creation of God. Satan already at work as the enemy of God's people. Satan coming as that ancient dragon of old to devour Eve and Adam. Someday I'll get into a t uh, that element where Adam gave Eve what she wanted. Everyone wants to make it seem like Adam was, bu uh, was busy digging holes or something. No, Adam was right next to her, and he said, for the sake of what my wife wants, we'll give in to this. But I won't get into that this morning. Just realize, realize, from the garden of Eve, fo uh, Eve forward, there's two seeds. The seed of the woman 
and the seed of the evil one. There will be enmity between your seed and your seed. Satan and the seed of the woman will clash throughout the ages. Cain and Abel, Isaac right, and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau. You go through the whole scripture, there's always this battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the evil one. Listen, he is our enemy. And if we don't realize this, we'll be like fools walking around our life thinking we're safe. We're safe from harm's way. No, that we would get a glimpse of who our enemy is so that we have a true foundation on which to fight that enemy and his kingdom. So that's one. Satan is our enemy. Now we must continue to have a solid and, and big enough theology to see two things. The work of Christ on the cross. Everyone this morning would say that it was for the sake of the sins of God's people. And amen. Penal substitutionary atonement. He took my place on the cross. He suffered my debt. He suffered my sin. He suffered wrath for me so that when I trust in him, I receive eternal life. Yes and amen. But the cross of Christ expands beyond that. What do I mean by this? Part of the work of Christ was literally to overthrow the kingdom of Satan, to usher in his kingdom, to disarm the rulers and the powers and the princes of the age. We can't reduce the work of Christ solely to saving our souls. That's the epitome. That's the height. That's the mission. And amen. But part of that mission was to literally dethrone Satan. You remember when we were in Mark chapter 3, we talked about when Christ had to bind the strong man. Well, who's the strong man? It was Satan. Christ had to come into this earth, bind the strong man, and plunder his goods. Who's the strong man? It's Satan. Whose house was it at that time? It was Satan. And Christ had to come and truly be the stronger man to rescue what was rightfully his. In John chapter 12, Jesus told his disciples, the prince of this world. Who's that? Satan is about to be cast down. The early church would refer to Christ as Christus Victor. Because they saw Christ was the victor over Satan and his kingdom. Namely, over Satan himself. Look what Hebrews 2 says. I'll read it for you. Since therefore the children share in, f in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. So it's saying, we were flesh and blood. Christ came and took on flesh and blood, that through, the, through death he might destroy, listen to this, listen to this, the one who has power of death. Satan had the power of death, and he made all of, all of creation be, in a sense, enslaved to that death. Because it says here, the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Look in this world. What's everybody scared to do? To die. Everyone outside of Christ is in bondage to the reality of death. But Christ comes and he takes the, the, the weapon of Satan and now he uses it against them. He turns it against them because his kingdom has come. Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Amen. We need to see this. Christ's work on the cross is primarily to purchase our souls, yes and amen. But at another aspect of this is that he would overthrow the, the, king, the, the kingdom of darkness. You read Colossians, you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. You were once in this world, and now you're in Christ. Realize that we were sons of disobedience, children of wrath, at enmity with God. The Bible actually says the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. If you look at the world and you wonder, how can they be this way? How can they enact such laws? How can they be so evil toward babies in the womb? It's because they're all under the sway of the wicked one. Church, realize, before Christ, you were under the sway of the wicked one. Realize, if you're outside of Christ this morning, you are still, without your knowledge, under the sway of the wicked one. But church, the veil came off. He gave us new life. 
the deception was gone. And now we fight against the remaining corruption that we have. So we must first realize, yes, there's a spiritual battle. And on the cross of Calvary, part of the spiritual war that was waged was to disarm Satan. So that now we, as Christians, live in a world that's no longer Satan's. Do you realize that? The prince has been cast down. We live in a world that's Christ. It's his kingdom. So with that in place, now we could rightly say, we're in a spiritual war. And what's our war? To advance the gospel. To take the gospel to the ends of the age, to the ends of the world. And every single part along the way, Satan is there like a pest. You know how the Bible describes Satan? Like a lion roaming around, seeking whom he can devour. If you don't realize that you're in a war, if you don't realize that Satan is himself seeking whom he can devour, you won't be ready for the fight. You'll be wasting your energy, you'll be wasting your efforts, you'll be wasting your days because you won't understand how to go about this mission. You know, it's not enough for a soldier to know, I'm in a war. But how you go about that mission matters. Imagine a stealth mission, right? You have all these Navy SEALs trying to go about in a stealth manner, and one guy goes out guns blazing with a highlighter vest on. That's not okay. He's now compromised the whole group because he took orders that were not accurate. We must know as a church how we advance, how we proceed, how we fight and wage war against the evil one. Realize, this is at the end of Ephesians. This is after the theology, after the unity after the practical application. So what's Paul saying? You want to have successful marriages? Put the whole armor of God on. You want to raise children of the Lord? Get ready for the fight. You want to be a good employee? Well, you better gird up the loins because you're about to fight the flesh like you've never known. Realize that all this is after the practical elements of Ephesians because Paul is wanting to show them you're going to need to put on the armor for the sake of your families for the sake of your jobs, for the sake of the city, for the sake of the church. You're going to need to be ready for this. So I would urge our church to realize through the week, Monday through Friday, if you don't approach your jobs, your marriages, your disciplining your children, your discipling your children, if you don't approach it as a war, you're not going to be ready for it. You're going to be constantly losing to the flesh. This is written to the book of, to, to, the, to the church at Ephesus. Why does that matter? Because Ephesus was steeped and steeped and steeped in witchcraft and idolatry. You read the book of Acts, and there's a riot that happens because God, Paul's gospel preaching has caused the sale of, of idolatrous figures to go, to go down that the merchants are upset. There's literally a riot that breaks out because Paul's preaching of the gospel has driven down the sails of the idols that were for Diana and the other idols of Ephesus. So why did Paul write to such length to the Ephesians? Realize, he didn't write this much uh, theology on spiritual warfare to the church at Philippi, to the church at Colossae. No, he wrote it specifically to the Ephesians because he wanted them to know, I know what you've seen. I know you've seen the power of darkness. I know you've seen what some do in the name of Diana. I know that you've seen some of your loved ones do some crazy things in that black magic, in that spiritual voodoo, as it were. What do we need this morning, church? I know you've seen the wickedness of government. I know you've seen the wickedness of the evil one as he's using puppets in this world to advance his kingdom. I know you've seen it. But Christ is getting his people to know through Paul's writing, don't worry, don't fret. Christ is the name above all names. Christ is the one who sits higher than any other king, far above all powers, far above all rulers, far above all authority. Christ reigns, dear church. Christ is on his throne. He has been given power and dominion. 
realize this morning, there's no higher name than the name of Jesus Christ. You know, I wanted a certain individual to get elected to president. And I saw my own heart. Because there was a sense where I thought, I feel safer if someone becomes president. It might be the case in a carnal sense. But what I forgot to preach to myself is higher than the name of any elected official is the name of Jesus Christ. More confidence should I place in the one who sits on the highest throne than the one who has a throne on this earth. Oh, that we would see, church, no matter what lies ahead, no matter how difficult the war is coming, we have a Jesus who none can rival. We have a king that none can stay his hand. We have a Lord that all one day will bow the knee to him. So as we engage, we must see, we don't put on armor that's fleshly. We put on Christ. He is our armor. We go to battle with Christ on us. We don't go to battle for Christ. No, we go to battle because we have Christ because we're already secure, because we're already strong in Him. So that's a spiritual battle. But how do we fight in it? Look at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Be strong in the Lord, church. Be strong in the Lord. Have courage. Have determination. Have a, a sense of urgency. Contend for the faith. Have a real, vital, and vigorous, bona fide, concrete strength. This is Paul saying, stand toe to toe with the evil one. Stand toe to toe with the kingdom of darkness. Fight it head on. But I'm asking you, dear church, from, when, from where does our strength come from? You go up to fight the kingdom of darkness toe-to-toe -to -toe in your own strength, <laughs> you won't even stand a second. You'll cower. No, we go before the kingdom of darkness fighting toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and Paul makes this point very clear. We are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We have union with Christ, meaning we are literally united mystically, mystic union with Christ. We're in Christ. We have a vital union with Christ. So we fight in His strength. You approach any area of your life. You call it. You name it. Where do you struggle? Think of it. You approach that in your wisdom, in your strength, in your ability to be godly. And you'll see how weak you really are. But no, you approach life in His strength and you stand firm in Christ. Then you'll see, in my weakness there is boasting because Christ is strong. Every good gift comes from above, dear church. Why would any of us boast? Where is boasting if He's the one who gives good gifts? So listen to what Paul is getting at. He's saying, be strong in the Lord, but in His power, in His might. Well, what does that even mean? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1 real quick. Paul, is, in a sense, is wrapping up this letter, and he's calling the attention of those at Ephesus to remember what he's already said. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. We'll begin at verse 18. Anytime you read Scripture, the book that you're reading is going to help you to understand the different aspects of the book that you're reading. So Paul writing one letter has one train of thought. He's ending it. Well, if he said this before, let's see what he said before to understand it. Look at verse 18. He says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable, listen to this, greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to, to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority 
and all power and dominion above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So where do you find our strength? In the power of his might. Well, what is the power of his might? It's the fact that Christ is alive this morning and that Christ is ruling and reigning, that Christ is not in the tomb this morning, that Christ was lifted up. More than that, he was seated in a position of authority and power, dear church. You find strength in the fact that your Lord is on the throne, that your Lord is ruling, that your Father is the one who's orchestrating all things that come to pass. This is the raw strength of God. The more that you can teach yourself to think in the reality of the fact that Christ is Lord. I'm going to go to work this morning. Christ is Lord over it. I'm going to help my children to grow in the Lord. Christ is Lord over it. I'm going to have to have a difficult conversation with someone that I love. Christ is Lord. And the more we teach our minds to think all things under the Lordship of Christ and the fact that He rules and He reigns, then there will be power. Not that comes from you, but that comes from on high. He is alive. And He's ruling. And He's reigning. You must see this, dear church. If we're going to advance the kingdom, if we're going to live our lives for His glory, it must be done in the reality that He reigns. Therefore, I go out. There's no higher throne than the throne of Christ, dear church. And if this does not make you want to beat your chest for him, not want to go to war for him, the fact that our king reigns, I know I keep saying it over and over again, but I see the way we live our lives and we're so fearful of what's to come. We live in such fear. When perfect love casts out fear, Paul had to drive this point home to the church at Ephesus, the church that was surrounded by idolatry and wickedness and darkness and the evil schemes of the evil one. And Paul had to remind them time and time again, Ephesians, I know you look around and you think, it can't be done. We won't survive here. I know you look around and think, I'm just fearful of what they'll do to me now that I'm a Christian. You look around and you see your loved ones being persecuted for the sake of Christ. You hear about Paul's imprisonment and Paul saying, no, stop looking around at your circumstances and start looking to the God who reigns on the throne. And he'll see you through. And he'll truly make Ephesus a footstool for the kingdom of Christ. This is what makes me want to fight in the fight, dear church. This is what makes me not want to pull out of the fight is the fact that my Lamb has won and is seated on the throne and He's in heaven even this morning receiving honor and power and glory as the myriads and myriads of Christians sit there before the throne saying, Glory and honor be unto your name. And we join up into that spiritually. So Christian, because God has already won, Go out there and fight for him in the strength of his might, in his strength, clothed with his power. He's worthy. It's a noble task that we've all been called to. We're not fit for the fight. Every morning we should wake up and think, I'm too weak for this fight. Lord, help me. My devotions are weak. My parenting is weak. My love for you is weak. My emotions are weak. My flesh is weak. I give in to sin. It's so weak. I'm so weak. I'm so pathetic. But that we would say, but you, O Lord, are strong in my weakness. So give me the strength to go about my life. Could you imagine if all of us this morning began our day by saying, Lord, I am weak. Strengthen me. Lord, make haste. Just last night, Isabella shared that psalm with me. And it's literally David crying out saying, I'm so weak. Lord, make haste and strengthen me. Lord, I'm weak. I don't want to read your word. Lord, I'm weak. I don't want to lead my family. Lord, I'm weak. I don't want to go to work. Lord, I'm weak. 
Oh, that we would beg the Lord as if we were truly weak and say, Lord, I won't let you go until you clothe me with power and strength to fight this fight. We've been given power, but it's not our own. It's in His Christ. It's in His power. It's Christ. It's His authority. I pray that as we begin to study through Ephesians, realizing we're in a spiritual war, that just this morning we would just catch a glimpse of our own weakness so that we could walk in His strength, the strength of the resurrected Messiah, the strength of the ascended one, the strength of the King of Kings. This is what will bring the nations to Christ. It's people realizing, I'm in a war, and Lord knows I need help in this war. Oh, that we would cry out for help this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we're thankful that you do not leave us in our weakness. There's no such thing as a weak Christian because Christians put on Christ who is mighty and who is strong. Lord, help us to fight in this spiritual war against the flesh, against sin, against the evil one. We need you, Lord. We are all truly weak in and of ourselves, but in Christ you make us strong. So help us, Lord. Help us to advance the kingdom. Help us to preach the gospel and help us to live our lives before your eyes, not being fearful of the world, but honoring our God and our Savior. In Christ's name, amen.